Hi there, this is Jim from Weird Nashville, and like you, I've been a Star Trek fan for all of my life, and I thought I knew all of the classic Star Trek secrets, like how they used to use salt shakers for Dr. McCoy's surgical instruments, how the Vulcan classic hand salute was based on a similar hand gesture used by Jewish rabbis, and how they originally made Walter wear a wig to make him resemble Davy Jones from the Monkees, and how you've only ever seen one side of the Starship Enterprise. But I recently discovered a Star Trek secret so obscure that almost no one even knows it. The clues to this secret were on public display for over 50 years. So join us after the break as we take a close look at the very best kept secret in Star Trek history. Now, I can tell you that making these mini documentaries has been an absolutely fascinating thing for me to do. And in this particular instance, I actually started researching a different item than the one we're going to first talk about. And it was in the research of that one item that a lot of people believe was mythical, I uncovered some truly amazing information that I just didn't know. Now, it's possible there are other people out there that knew it. As a matter of fact, I know some people did, but I'm willing to bet that a large portion of the viewers of this video will not know this information. That being said, most people know that the filming model of the USS Enterprise from Star Trek was donated to the Smithsonian Institution back in 1974. When the Smithsonian received the Enterprise in 74, they found it to be in pretty dire condition. This photograph clearly shows us what the left side looked like, with all the wires and cables hanging down from a secondary hull and even from the nacelles. If you search for vintage photos of the left side of the Enterprise, this is one of the very ones you will first see, because it was really one of the first times that people took a deliberate photo of the unfinished side because they wanted to show the magic behind the appearance. Now, we Star Trek fans tend to view the Enterprise as if she were a real ship, when in fact, she actually has two completely separate identities. The first identity is the fictional Starship Enterprise featured in the TV series. The second identity is the practical effects filming model used to create the illusion of the first identity. That unique bridge between fantasy and reality is what makes the model so very valuable to us, emotionally as well as memorably. And the Smithsonian will tell you that that unique combination of appeals is precisely why she deserves to be in the museum along with other real-life items that inspired us. Now, this very last high-resolution picture shows us close-up views of two very important pieces of information that we need to know as we begin our journey together. One, you can clearly see where the cables come out of the nacelles, complete with an electrical plug on the end. Two, you can also see that the left nacelle has the familiar red and yellow pennant decoration that we are used to seeing. Now, with that in mind, we have to recognize that since 1974, the original 11-foot studio model has been seen by thousands, maybe even millions. Most fans already knew that the port, or left-hand side, of the Enterprise was the location where the wires and cables that ran the intricate lighting systems had been installed. Those cables emerged from holes drilled in both the cells and within the secondary hull itself. Now, these holes would never be seen on camera. So as a result, the entire time they used the model, the model had only ever been filmed on the right side. Over the years, that fact has been very well documented. For instance, this is a photo of the Smithsonian Conservation Team gently removing the Enterprise from her longtime perch in the basement of the gift shop. The comment you see is from the curator in charge of exhibiting the model, in which she notes that, quote, one side is the fully painted, fully decorated side of the model that always faced the camera. The other side was never fully decorated because the camera would never see it, unquote. So far, so good. Nothing new there. So while doing research for the video that we did on the Smithsonian's care and feeding of the model for the last 50 years, I took notice of something that I had seen but never grasped the implications of before. 
Now before I could be sure of myself, I needed to go back and take a look at the unfinished side of the model in each of the previous restorations that had been done. When they first put it on display in 74, again in 1984, in 1991, and most recently in 2016. And there it was. In every photo that I could find, the left or port nacelle was fully decorated which also matches the very small partial view we had in the photo showing the left side of the model when the museum first received the Enterprise, indicating that the nacelle had always been painted. But why? It made no sense to me that they would have detailed only the left nacelle and left the rest of the left-hand side completely undecorated. Even more confusing is that you can clearly see the hole that had been cut into the model in order to complete the lights installation. That's the hole that had the little electrical plug hanging out of it a few minutes ago. In a nice touch, the Smithsonian's restoration was so complete in 2016 that they even included the little plug hanging down from the left nacelle. So it was obvious to me that there was never any need to paint the nacelle because it would never have been photographed. But what if the nacelle had been painted before the lights had been installed? The very first time the model was seen in public is when it was delivered to the Howard Anderson Company by the gentleman they had retained to have the model constructed, Richard Dayton. Now, the photo on the top left-hand corner actually shows the Enterprise as it's being delivered. Dayton is on the far left. The other two gentlemen are actually people that he contracted out to that actually did the fabrication. The lower right-hand photograph is a photo much later in life for Richard where he's in front of the Enterprise while it's on display in the basement of the gift shop. And I will tell you this much, and I'm probably going to do a video on this, but the whole story of Richard Dayton and his quest to at least be recognized as the man who built the model is convoluted enough to be its own documentary. And maybe I'm going to do that. Here's an interesting tidbit, though. At 11 foot, 2 inches long, it would be the largest miniature model ever made. But before he built that model, he had also delivered a 3 foot model that was supposed to be the reference model, but was so well made, they actually decided to use it for filming the cage while the 11 foot model was completed. Because Gene Roddenberry had specifically told him the models wouldn't be lighted, he delivered the 3 foot model fully complete on both sides, so they could be filmed from either side. What if he had done the same to the 11 foot model? Is it possible? that contrary to everything we've ever seen or read for the past five decades, that the larger model had not always been naked on the left side? They had, in fact, originally been complete on both sides? Now, unfortunately, almost anyone that had actually been around when the model was first seen is no longer with us. Matt Jeffries, Herb Salo, Gene Roddenberry, Bob Justman, and of course, Richard Dayton. So with no one to really ask directly, we turn to the internet with the question, was the left side of the Star Trek USS Enterprise Studio model always unpainted and unfinished? Not unexpectedly, there was no hidden gem of information to uncover, even though there were over a million responses. However, at one point in my endless searching, and believe me, there's days that it really does feel like they go on forever, I got the most unexpected hit when using the keywords Dayton, Model, and Enterprise. It seems that the children of Richard Dayton have published a book. I put an affiliate link down in the description for this video, based on the written notes and materials that their father had left behind after his passing. Now, I've mentioned in other videos that when you're doing research, the very best sources of information are always contemporary documentation. And here was a self-published book promising to have one-of-a-kind information not available anywhere else. So I gave Amazon my money and waited for the book to arrive. Not long afterwards, the mailman delivered the 172-page self-published book. As I began reading in earnest, I hit Pater on page 80, where Dayton's notes discussed the changes needed to the 11-foot model in order to add lights in the secondary hull and the cells. He said, with the changes in the lights, power was routed through the support stand on the front of the secondary hull, and the wires were run on the outside of the model because the nacelle struts were constructed of solid wood. 
Power cables pierced the left side of the Enterprise at several spots. Now, the model could only be filmed from the right side, and some detail has been therefore omitted. Another passage right below it says, Originally, my father stated, the left side was as detailed as the right when it was first delivered before it was subjected to the changes for lighting requested by Gene. So Dayton had said that the model was finished on both sides when he delivered it to Howard Anderson's for the cage. And of course, as everyone knows, a whole bunch of photos were taken on that very day. Four of the most popular are shown here on the screen. But as luck would have it, apparently not a single picture was taken of the left side of the model. So after the model was delivered, she was suspended from the ceiling and they used her to film a single sequence for the cage, the shot used at the very beginning where it pans into the bridge. Note that unlike later setups, the model hung stationary with only a single side visible to the camera. So I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. And once again, we have a finished left side that simply was never recorded. Now, filming for the cage completed on January 22nd, 1965. Since they had just used the three-foot model for everything other than the one scene, Gina asked Howard Andersons to shoot a little more footage of the model before they put it away. Remember, they didn't know if they were going to be picked up as a series or not, so Gene wanted to take advantage of have additional footage taken right now rather than waiting for the series to be picked up. This shot, originally discovered amongst slides that Gene would later sell as part of Lincoln Enterprises, identifies this photograph to take place on January 23rd, 1965. And this looks to be a shot of the same first photo, but without the crew member. We're going to take a look at several surviving shots from the session, but no actual footage of the session has been uncovered to date. In yet another slide-based photo, note the gentleman in this photo is shirtless. This would prove to be an issue every time they filmed the 11-foot model. The required lights in the studio generated an enormous amount of heat, so they would regularly take their shirts off to fight the oppressive temperatures in the studio. As before, we're now looking pretty much at the same shot, again without the crew member. Finally, we have two last shots. Notice that you can see the wire that the model is hanging from in the top left-hand photo. Now, all we know about these is they were taken after the first pilot, but before the second pilot, which would film about six months later. In addition to the two clapboards, we can see that this model is suspended here for filming, we've talked about that before, an approach that they would never use again after this. In fact, Dayton would go on as saying that suspending the model from the ceiling placed too much stress on the model. Future sessions would see the model mounted from a stand on the floor. And finally, the most unusual fact of all of these photos is that the nacelle end covers are completely flat. This is a condition that would never actually be used in Star Trek. By the time they got to the second pilot, the end caps would have vent holes on them. So you would think that if there was any chance that the model had actually been finished on both sides, surely someone would have bothered to take a photo. Right? Anytime anybody gets near the model, they simply take more photos. This is probably the most photographed ship, fictional, historical, or otherwise, that has ever existed. So maybe, maybe I wasn't really onto anything at all. The word was given on June 11th, 1965, that another pilot had been ordered. We are leaving that vast cloud of stars and planets which we call our galaxy. Behind us, Earth, Mars, Venus, even our sun, are specks of dust. A question. What is out there in the black void beyond? Until now, our mission has been that of space law regulation, contact with Earth colonies, and investigation of alien life. But now, a new task. A probe out into where no man has gone before. But this time, Gene wanted lights on the 11-foot model. In particular, he wanted running lights in the saucer in the secondary hull. The addition of the lighting effects was pretty more complex. The port side of the model was drilled into to accommodate all the extra cables. Light bulbs were installed inside the secondary hull, dorsal, and saucer, which illuminated windows that had been cut into the skin of the model. Blinking white anti-collision lights were also added to the saucer in the secondary hull. After the changes were made, the Enterprise sat atop a new swiveling floor stand that would now allow them to film the model in a variety of angles. Once again, Dozens of photos and video clips were created to use in the second pilot. Additional scenes would also be recorded in an attempt to begin a library of standard video effects. 
which proved to be a wise decision since they did end up using that library over and over again during the entire three year run of the TV series, although it would result in the Enterprise slightly changing appearance during a single episode. Maybe one clip would have been taken from around the time they filmed Where No Man Has Gone Before, and another clip could be taken from after they did the series updates that included the multicolor nacelle end caps. And yet, once again, no amount of digging on the internet could bring up a single photo of the mysterious left side of the Starship Enterprise at that point in 1965. By this time, probably over 100 professional photographs have been taken, but not a single one of the left side. So what's the deal? Am I chasing unicorns? Maybe Dayton's comment about finishing on both sides was a red herring. It wouldn't be the first time I've encountered that during Trek research. But then I remembered the last Smithsonian restoration. In particular, you're going to find this fairly funny. I remembered the hanging power plug. That's the trigger. Surely this would have had to have been a topic that came up as they were trying to restore the model to its second season configuration. Now, there are times when you find it hard to believe that this little blue ball that is our own personal sandbox for existence is populated by people that can get along. But one of the things that unites us as a species is our shared passions override our shared prejudices. Not all of us share the same passions, but when we do encounter folks that do, it allows for some truly special interactions. One of the people that I have been blessed to have contact with as a result of this channel is Mr. Doug Drexler. He has been a part of Star Trek for decades, and his fingerprints are all over some of our best memories as fans. The photo you see here sums it up beautifully. He designed the NX-01, among other things, and just behind him is an honest-to-God Academy Award, which he earned as a result of his work on the Warren Beatty adaption of Dick Tracy. Doug was part of that Smithsonian restoration. So I reached out to him with my thoughts and suspicions. And not long afterwards, he writes back and confirms what I had been suspecting all along. Even more, he actually managed to find an actual photograph showing the left side while it still had paint and detailing on the left nacelle and the left side of the secondary hull. Now, the photo was not the best, but trust me, it was beautiful to me when I saw it because it confirmed what I had suspected. Now, I have attempted to enhance this photo very specifically to increase the clarity and the detail of the model. So obviously, you can see the detailing on the left nacelle. We expected that. But you can also see the detail and painting is still very much part of the secondary hull as well. Lastly, you can also see that the electrical wires they ran through the model, as well as the holes they had to drill into the left side of the neck and the secondary hull as a result. Amazingly, the path the wires take as they move across the secondary hull has been faithfully duplicated in the last Smithsonian restoration for the very first time. There is apparently one detail that was not present on the left side, and that is the small block that the right has under its pennant. So on the bottom left hand corner of the screen, you can see the right hand side of the ship with the block under the pennant, whereas on the lower right hand side of the screen, you can see the left hand side of the ship that does not. This was obviously a cost reduction measure. Every penny counted for them. So it looks like we have yet another Star Trek myth to evaluate. Here we have a good encapsulation of how the myth started. I'm just going to touch over the areas highlighted in blue. The other side of the 11 foot shooting model was totally naked. The other side was never fully decorated because the camera would never see it. Only one side of the model was painted. But let's make something 100% clear here. Not a single one of those statements is deliberately misleading in any way. In fact, the only time the model was ever filmed while both sides were completely finished was when they filmed the cage. And when they used the model for the single shot in the cage, they didn't show the left or port side. I believe that anyone associated with Star Trek professionally knew this fact and was most likely never occurred to them that a large number of fans would interpret what was being said as any kind of contradiction as the changes that Gene wanted made to the model 
required the left side to never be used again. Now, obviously, at some point, probably in the post where no man has gone before changes that Jean wanted, the secondary hull was completely stripped of any adornment and never received detail ever again. Why they left the nacelle details, I will never know. But over 50 years later, it caused this Star Trek fan to question what he had believed for decades. So myth busted. Now you may remember at the beginning of the video, I said I was actually doing a video for a different aspect of Star Trek when I stumbled into the rabbit hole that became the, this video for the most part. There is a story going around that many have actually claimed was a myth or even fraud to get money from fans. When the series was picked up, there was yet another series of changes that needed to be made to the model. In addition to adding the multicolored lights in the front of each of the nacelles, the painted on NCC 1701 was removed from the right nacelle and from this point forward, the numbers would come from decals made for shooting. The decal sheet you see here shows the reverse lettering that would allow the series to shoot the model and then flip the film and it would look like the Enterprise was passing from left to right. Now the first issue of this is that while Richard Dayton did say they existed and he had made them, he didn't like the idea of them being associated with his name when they were being sold on eBay. They were entirely too easy to copy and he wanted no part of having to validate them. There is one man, however, who has a clear chain of evidence as to where he got the ones he has. And that gentleman is Mr. Craig Thompson. A former crewman at Desilu, he arranged for the Enterprise to be on display during a large weekend exhibition at a college. When he returned the model, he had forgotten to return the decal sheets. Paramount told him, keep them. They didn't want them. And this is a still from one of the library shots done with the decals. You can clearly see the decal is reversed. A lot of fans do not believe the decals ever existed. And the reason they did that is because... The three times that the Enterprise was shown going in the opposite direction, so we had to see the left side of the Enterprise, two times they used the decals, and the third time they didn't. They just flipped it over, and if you actually look at it, you can actually see the letters being backward. The very fact that most of these fans can remember seeing that they did see reversed numbers automatically leads them to believe that they were never right to begin with. They were always reversed. Now, this is apparently the shot that they used in the episode Dagger of the Mind. Notice that the nacelles have not been completely electrified. Since we know this was taken before the series updates were made, it is somewhat of a mystery as to why they didn't use this shot everywhere. Now, as I had said, a lot of fans doubt the decals are legit because they show the Enterprise many times by simply flipping the film and letting the Enterprise begin to creep across the screen and then cutting the scene off just before the first of the letters would show up. And in other cases, they just simply flipped the film and didn't care about the numbers. So in the issues Shorely, for example, they used both of those tricks. Although, you can clearly see the reversed registry proving they didn't use the decals in Shorely. Now, in Mirror Mirror, they did use the decals. So it looks a little bit jerky as it goes across the screen, but you can clearly see that even though it's going across the screen in the opposite direction we're used to, the letters are legible. Therefore, we're looking at the decal. Finally, in Dagger of the Mind, we hit pay dirt. This scene clearly shows the numbers correctly, even though they still flipped the film. And that brings us today to the end of this video. I hope that you have enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like the video. That way it'll show up more often to people who haven't seen it yet. Also, please be sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to see some of the stuff that we've got coming out, as well as some examples you see here on the screen of stuff that's waiting for you already in the archives. Once again, I want to thank you very much for your time. I look forward to talking to you again. Until then, live long and prosper.